Um, okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, psychological safety in IT post mortems. Um, let's just be clear, just because I'm, st I'm stood here, wasn't the only reason why I'm doing the talk. The other guys did have a chance to say, no, no, you're not doing this talk. Um, so on that basis, we're going to proceed. Um, so yeah, I work for a database, I've already mentioned them. Um, Platinum partner for Atlassian, Jira Confluence, admin type stuff. We'll run your Jira's and Confluence's for you if you want. Um, we also do a lot of professional services around those things and getting the stuff delivered using the Atlassian stack and other tools. Um, so yeah, you know me. Um, well, I stand up here and make a fool of myself on a regular basis, but I'm also the head of DevOps, um, which isn't a job title um, for an activist. Um, so I'm a little bit torn on that one. I think it may be okay, given the Actually, no, it's not okay. I should just change my job title. Um, so yeah, psychological safety in IT postmortems. This is um, this is actually a talk I've given before um, the Alaskan summit uh, a few weeks ago um, in Barcelona. Um, so apologies if you've seen it before. Um, I don't think any of you were there, so there weren't many people there at all. Never mind. Um, so uh, just anecdotally, um, this talk has recently today had the word IT inserted into it because uh, my employer posted this on Facebook. Uh, yes, no. <laughs> Post mortem is going to be a stressful experience for all involved. So, um, one of my favourite senior consultants, um, sorry, the manager consultants now, a database, um, Michael Jamie, um, he works with a nurse. Uh, he works with a, sorry, he, uh, he's married to a nurse. Sorry, working and being married, kind of the same sort of thing when you're like me. Um, he's married to a nurse, and she saw this on Facebook. And she's, Jamie, what on earth are you actually doing in a database? And post mortem is a stressful experience. Yeah, if you're involved in a post mortem, then that's possibly the most stressful thing of your entire life, except you're dead. Um, so, yes, so um, a long and short way of saying that this talk is now titled Psychological Safety in IT Post Mortems. The law of unintended consequences. It's fine if you're the court. It's fine if you're the courts, yeah. Um, where your courts is um, a rotting.com uh, website that is losing $10 million an hour, I guess. Okay, so this is supposed to be a serious kind of thought provoking talk, and I've got to sport it about that, I think, though, never mind. Um, so, who's done a post mortem? Basically, you've had an incident, something's gone wrong, you've done a post mortem. You know, I know a few pages you talk about doing post mortems, um, so we kind of know what we're, why we're doing them. Um, the reasons, um, fundamentally, is to understand what happened. Um, and um, just to be clear, I'm not going to talk about actually doing post mortems to a great extent. I'm going to talk about how to make people safe in that environment. Um, so we want to understand what happened. Um, and we want to figure out how to avoid um, this happening again. Um, and we also want to appease management. You know, people jumping up and down saying, why is the cycle down again? We're losing $10 million per microsecond or whatever it is. Um, but most fundamentally, modern organisations have come to the realisation um, that you're doing these to, to learn from what happened um, and make things better. Because the goal of post mortem is actually to turn every problem into a learning experience. So the problem with that is that Failure is often complex. So before we go on, does anybody take the issue with like these reasons for doing post mortems? It's like blame people at shit. What was that, Sean? It's like blame people at shit. Because you like blaming people at shit. It's quite an excuse to fire everyone. Well, yeah, yeah. That, that is, if, if you're one of those people, then um, you need to pay special attention. Um, yeah, failure is complicated. So. Well, maybe you've been there, you, you know, you're in, a, in an outing situation, why did something fail? Oh, and the management generally want a very, very clear cut answer to that. Oh, this thing failed. Oh, okay. Then we only have one of these. Okay, let's have some redundancy. Something like that. Um, but it's often not like that. Has anyone read this paper by Richard Cook? How complex systems fail? Yeah, a couple of nods. Um, so Richard Cook um, speaks at uh, DevOps Enterprise Summit. Uh, quite regularly, um, moves in these theme circles of uh, Gene Kim, John Willis, those sort of people, um, has done a lot of um, proper analysis on how things actually fail. So things like when planes fall out of the air, um, and uh, comes to various conclusions. Um, 
of which um, I won't go into too much detail um, because it's just a short talk. Um, but I'll just call, call out a couple of these things. Um, the first one is that post accident attribution, uh, post -accident att attribution to a root cause is fundamentally wrong. Um, that's one of the findings in Dr. Cook. So, why did the gizmo fail? Because it wasn't made of the right material. Okay, let's change it to a different material. You get into, well, why was it made of that material in the first place? What corner were cut, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another thing that he talks about is that hindsight biases the post-accident assessment of performance. So you look back on something and you're like, ah, yeah, that's obvious why that's failed, right? The other thing that I work all out from, um, from his uh, paper is that a catastrophe, so the site actually going hard down if you're running a website, or the plane falling out of the air, or the train hitting the buffers, it generally requires multiple failures. There's more than one thing that goes wrong. And those things accumulated together are what cause the actual catastrophe. So you're doing a post-mortem. Um, Sean has already stolen my thunder slightly. If I talk about what goes wrong in post-mortems. Um, and let's go through some examples. So you're going through a post-mortem and people are saying things like this. Well, it's obvious what happened. Um, and that's a bias that can happen in a post-mortem where um, perhaps somebody who's prejudiced to a particular outcome. Maybe there's a manager in the room um, who wants a particular outcome that's going to give his team more work, um, thus making him look better, or, or maybe someone just wants to gloss over things because they made a mistake and they're embarrassed and want to get through things uh, quickly. Um, sometimes you see things like this. Joel screwed up. Or, sorry, is anyone called Joel in the room? <laughs> <laughs> oh, when I did this talk in, in Barcelona, there was a Joel, and he, he looked. I was hoping for a little bit of banter about that, um, but he looked kind of um, devastated when I called him out in public, even though I didn't mean actually him. Um, I screwed up, so people would come out and say, well, actually, I screwed up. Um, and that could be a dangerous thing. I will say things like, well, these people need to be retrained. trained You get all these things that come, come in when um, people are kind of prejudiced to what the outcome might be. Um, Code is bad, there's another one. Developers. Developers. Who's the developer in the room? Anyone? That's the developer. It's you. <laughs> you! Your name's really Joel, isn't it? Come on. Um, yeah, look at the developer. You, you get sides taken, Bob String, the who's the last person? Yay! Okay, lots of people didn't put their hand up to either, so I'm wondering just see how the beats are. Yeah, okay. Um, so what goes wrong? Um, people's pride gets hurt. Um, who, who likes making mistakes? Come on, honestly. Might I know you two put your hands up. In a professional situation um, where, not that I'm implying you work in non unprofessional organisations, um, it can hurt. You know, you're there, people are there to do a good job. I mean, let's, let's try not to be the, the bearded cynics that some of us really are. Um, you go in and want to do a good job. Is that the piece of chat? Um, people's pride gets hurt, um, and they feel repercussions. Um, who's ever made a mistake and fear for their job? Um, yeah, mods all around. Um, even if it wasn't your fault, or even if it was your fault, um, people feel guilty as well. So what happens is when you're running a post-mortem, people don't feel like they can be honest. Um, you end up in a situation where you're almost kind of um, expected to speak, but you're trying to figure out what the best thing is actually to say to avoid, I don't know, the strip lights turning red and suddenly throwing things at you and then somewhere really ejecting you from the building with P45. And it's all down to prejudice, basically. Prejudice of the situation. Um, so these things come about because of organisational silos. We have a bit of banter about dev versus ops. But when things are going wrong, there's money on the line, people's jobs are maybe on the line, then these things can get really, really solidified. Um, the organisational silos that people are working. So you get people taking sides, and you get people grouping together to prejudice the outcomes. Management interference. Sometimes you end up with a manager sat in the room. Maybe there's a load of techies, a load of uh, uh, doers, um, and a manager in the room, um, and that guy wants, or girl wants to spear the conversation in a certain direction uh, for political reasons. Um, sometimes it's not that Machiavellian, though. It's just a desire for a simple outcome. Um, so it can be a happy path where it seems like 
some piece of equipment failed, okay, we'll find, we'll make sure the next time we have two of those pieces of equipment or we get a better one. The blame is the big one. Um, in some organisations you have this blame culture. Um, who considers themselves to work in an organisation um, where there is a blame culture? No, I didn't expect. Okay, so a couple of people did put their hands up. <laughs> um, and it, this can happen, maybe not at a macro level, but maybe at a micro level, um, where there is pressure from upstairs to find an accountable person. It's an old fashioned way of doing things, but there are companies that are still like that. So, that's all the things that can go wrong. Um, how do we fix this? Um, I want to emphasise that we're talking about how to run effective post mortems that won't hurt the team. Because you're working as a team, you're working together, you win together, you lose together. So here's some guidelines on how to fix this. Um, so if you're running a post-mortem, let's make sure the fire is out first. So the incident's happened, you've had the outage, everyone stops shouting, people are calmer, um, and um, you've had a bit of time to reflect on things. Um, moderation, um, if you can find someone who wasn't actually involved, to run a post has anyone actually done that? Find a third party. Um, you need to find someone who has a bit of vested interest in specific outcomes or was involved um, to facilitate this if you're going to get the most neutral outcome. Um, and then, fairly plainly, um, segment it, gather some information of what actually happened, um, what are the hard and fast things that we know about, look at your orchestration, uh, sorry, your. Um, your observation systems, um, your monitoring, when did things actually happen, who did what, refer back to Slack, Slack chats, etc. Um, then you spend some time analysing what's going on. Then crucially, you need to find a common understanding. This is where it often goes wrong, where people come away from uh, opposing autumn with different ideas of what actually just was decided or understood there. Um, and that's where the importance of a facilitator, at least someone who can dig their heels in, um, is important. If you can get a common understanding, then you can draw some conclusions. Um, there's a trap here, which is that if you do have a divergence, then some people in the room will shut up, they'll just stop talking and wait for the meeting to, to be over and the conclusions uh, to be drawn that um, are not really based on their own understanding. Um, and what happens when you do that is that you go away with different ideas of what just got agreed there. Um, and from there, you, re you can't really improve anything because people aren't actually all on the same page. <clears throat> Focus uh, goes with, um, without saying. Um, you can't do this sort of thing while sat at your desks while watching monitoring systems or Slack or, or, or Netflix or whatever. Um, no device isn't used plenty of time. Um, so, here's a good article. Anyone read this one? John Allspore, famous post-mortems and the just culture. Um, fundamentally, this talk is based around this paper. Um, John Osborne was the CTO of Flickr and Etsy, um, and um, he kind of started this movement, this movement of understanding that actually if you put a load of people in the room and shine a light in, in their face um, and try and work out what actually happened, you're probably not going to get any real proper answers. Um, so yes, please don't go and refer back to that. So when you're running the post-mortem, you have to let everyone speak without judgment. It sounds like a very kind of fluffy thing. Um, and well, it is, it's a culture thing, it's a people thing, um, and I hope I've explained some of the reasons why people don't necessarily um, say what they mean. If you're setting the scene incorrectly for them and not allowing them the space to talk without prejudice and without judgment, um, then you're not gonna get the answers you're looking for. Make sure the narrative is agreed by everyone. It's a key thing I've already laid the point on, so I won't go into it um, much more. Here's a nasty one. <clears throat> Except that the post-mortem may highlight organisational issues. Um, yeah, we, we're all DevOps in this room, right? But we still work in silos some of the time. Um, it's, it's almost inevitable. Um, and you get groups, and you get kinks, um, and you get... Um, you, when, when, when things go wrong, that's when you really start to understand um, who's actually putting in the same direction as you, um, and that becomes an organizational issue, um, which needs to be addressed at a higher level. Um, and that can be difficult, because sometimes some of us have worked in organizations where we've banged up against this for years, um, when you know that you're having outages, and more and more outages, um, superficial post-mortems, but because the organization won't let you change things in the way you need to change them, 
you don't actually get things fixed. Oh, so that's a bit of a depressing end, never mind. <laughs> so what have we learned? What have we learned today? Um, number one, it's not a blame game. If you set out trying to blame people, then you're going to set everyone off on edge. You're going to make people resistant to trying to innovate, resistant to even just doing their day jobs. Um, and um, that's a good way of freezing up your, your, um, um, your innovation. The other thing is if you, if you blame someone, get them fired, and the next guy comes along, or girl comes along, um, has to make all those mistakes again, because you've not fixed the system at all. So there's no point blaming people. Make it a constructive thing. If, um, if you learn from this, if you can take actionable things away from a post-mortem that are actually actionable in your organisation, um, then you can improve things. Organisational dysfunction is the biggie. Um, and, and yes, that could be a hard nut to crack. Crucially, you have to insulate your people from fear. Um, I don't work too well under pressure. Um, well, there's good pressure and there's bad pressure. If there's pressure around getting crucified when you make a mistake, um, or pressure over making the wrong decision, um, then you're not going to make good decisions. Um, so this is the key thing that, that goes through an organisation, not just the post-mortem level, but also um, in your general day-to-day. -day, you've got to let people feel safe. It feels like, oh, I don't know, I said, oh, no, you be safe. But the reality is we're all humans here. Some of us have got thick skins, um, but it shouldn't have to be like that. And the problem is, if you only have an, if you have an organisation where only people with thick skins can survive, um, then you get almost the, the, that then affects the, stru the, the structure of your organisation, the sort of people you can hire, um, the ability to get a diverse <coughs> workforce who aren't necessarily like that. And as we already know, um, diverse workforces are much more. Productive. <coughs> a few quotes just to end on um, before we go and dive into the pizza. Um, failure is the key to success. Each mistake teaches us something. This is Morihai Ushiba. Do you know who he is? Go on. Jiu Jitsu guy. Jiu Jitsu guy, yeah, he went to Jiu Jitsu. Not, maybe that's a good post mortem technique, just go Jiu Jitsu the hell out of everyone else who disagrees with you. I didn't say that. Cut that from the video. Um, <laughs> Paolo Coelho. Um, there is only one thing that makes the dream impossible to achieve, and that's the fear of failure. Uh, again, another quote which sounds kind of trite, but I'm hoping what I just said gives it some, reson some resonance. Um, yeah, people who are scared um, don't innovate, they don't deliver. Um, if you feel safe, um, then the mind blossoms. Fear cuts deeper than source. George R. R. Martin. <laughs> that's it, thank you. to a good investigation, well don't call it post-mortem, call it an investigation, but one of the prerequisites is that your team actually has to be a team. They have to be playing together, not against each other. And I would say yeah. one of the other things is that one of the benefits of DevOps is always touted to be that you can fail small and quickly and recover quickly. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And if you can set your organisation up like that to do that, then you're going to be all the better for it. Um, the problem is, in these sort of situations, you start to realise how committed your organisation actually is um, to working together. Um, and sometimes it doesn't go quite so well. But sometimes it does, let's not be clear on this. So go on. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious how you practice what you preach. Obviously, we bring in a lot of different people uh, in the job that we do. Uh, and I'm just curious about basically what measures do you put in place? How do you prepare people for the sort of team that you want? Uh, people to sort of integrate into and how you want them to act. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> so it's stressed right from the beginning. Um, I'm fairly fortunate in the organisation I work for in that um, it may be getting up to 200 people, but it's still got that family personal feel. Um, I think there's a lot of things around um, hiring um, for organisational fit. No, no, that's not quite the right word. Um, it's, um, it's best about hiring good people who. Um, of, if you can get the right people in the door to start with, then you have fewer problems um, with attitudes further down the line. Um, it can be that um, 
when you get a bit further down the line and you've got um, people who are maybe not particularly good team players that you start to get these problems that are worse. Um, and if you're in that situation, then you really need to take the higher. Um, you need to look at how the organisation has got into a stage where you've got a team that isn't properly, properly DevOps fundamentally, cross-functional collaborative team, the whole two pieces, Jeff Bezos thing. Um, and um, if you can't actually get to that easily, um, then yeah, you're in trouble. So I'm not brilliant at all, I suppose. As a sort of follow-up to that then, um, do you feel there are any sort of measures that you can take in the interim uh, where if you start to sort of perceive any action taken against what you've been preaching, um, there's any sort of workshops or anything like that, or how can you make people feel welcome into the team and, um, and basically sort of feel enveloped by the ethos that you've been talking about? So, um, I think the answer to that is kind of social. Um, it's not, you know, there's not a stereotype that, you know, um, oh, we don't hire anyone who we can't take down the pub and have a laugh with. Um, I think that one's kind of hopefully gone by the wayside because it's discriminatory. Um, but it's that sort of thing. Um, you can build an organisation um, that, um, so, so there's two things here. You can get pool tables and football tables um, and um, have uh, social sessions and all that stuff. Um, but if, um, if the people who are directing the business and the people who are your managers and your directors aren't believing in that and uh, uh, you know, really believing in it, not just like, oh, just shut a couple of pool tables in the corner here or on quiet, um, then, um, then you're a bit stuffed, I think. Um, you're going to have a struggle there. Um, because sooner or later you find that these divisions are operating above your pay grade or above my pay grade. And if you haven't got support top down, um, then you're going to struggle. Totally agree, thank you. Cool, thank you. Go on then, Sean. Hey, Matt. Single question, please. <laughs> I'm probably going to do that really terrible thing when I answer myself. But, <laughs> how is it? How do you reconcile multiple blameless post mortems with somebody's genuine inability to learn from their mistakes? The management of the organisation is simple. Actually, it's not simple. Do you, you need to separate the processes in some way, I guess. Yes, so there is a temptation of you. You'll you be like, oh, yeah, well, everyone's got a safe culture and everything. And oh dear, poor Johnny, he typed RM minus RF slash when he went to type uptime. Um, and, oh no, he's done it again. Oh, poor, poor Johnny, why were there no safety nets to stop him from doing that sort of Yeah, you, you've got to kind of draw a line somewhere. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, if you imagine trying to manage someone out of business who is incompetent, um, then you, you need to counter what this against that. So, um, to distill your argument, uh, to distill your answer in some way, protect them from themselves. Yeah, yeah automate them out of fucking up. Um, and, and also, if that still doesn't work, take it to the next level. Yeah, yeah I think that's it.